I'm joined by Brendan O'Friel, a man that's uh, obviously known here in the Isle of Man for being in the travel watch business, but obviously for the people who know you a bit further, Brad, Brendan, you are an ex-prison governor, and boy, have you had some tales to tell in your time, strange ways. And all Absolutely. That. But today you are here as an author. Yes. Because, can I hold this up? Yes, no. indeed. Which one, let me hold it on your camera next to your face. There we go. So, Prisoner Governor's Journal. So this is spilling the beans, is it? On spilling your life? the beans. Not spilling just the strange ways, but because you've been around a few places. Oh, you? yes, a few places, it? yes. Uh, a total of seven. Wow. Yes. Well, I, I, I went to, to Strange Ways twice, so in fact, you know, it was, it was eight postings, if you like. Right. What, what's the sort of headline in here, then? I mean, this well, is the, not he an the headline job. in here is sort of, it's a bit late, really, to be um, writing a book like this. I mean, you've been retired 20 years. A number of people <laughs> have it? said that to me from the prison service. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I mean, it's quite an interesting tale, how, how it came about, because... The uh, straight after Strange Ways, as you can imagine, a number of the publishers came along and said, you got to write something, you got to write something, you know. And of course, I was jolly busy at the time, so it was a bit difficult to do. And then when I retired, um, I started talking to publishers. And to be honest, I found the most, they weren't very encouraging. There were mainly obstacles put in the way, and I, I didn't really feel I was getting very far. That's interesting. So, what you mean? You couldn't say it as you wanted to. There exactly. Were, yeah. There, oh. there was too much. They wanted to spice it up or change yeah, and things. And there wasn't much enthusiasm, oh. frankly. Oh. So okay, fine. You know, uh, I so I put it to one side and went and did lots of other things. And then I mean, I had written, uh, you know, a bit down, and I got a lot of records. Um, and then about 2015, I did a. I was, played a big part in a BBC Two television 25 years on from the riot. And um, when my grandchildren saw that, and some of them are now, you know, older teenagers, they started asking questions. And I thought, I've got to get this written down. Mm. So back I went, did a bit more writing, you know. And then, of course, what finally sparked it for me was a pandemic, because I thought, oh, my God, I thought of those prisoners, the mm. staff, um, in overcrowded prisons, not just in England, but all over the world. Um, what an awful thing to happen. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm going to get my two penny worth in, now's the time to do it. And I've managed it. I, I am, I'm slightly uh, bemused that I've actually managed to you know, write the book, get it published, and here we are, it's actually on sale. So are you lifting the lid or anything? I mean, is oh. it... Is it a Oh, yes. Is it walls and all? There's a few lids. Have you upset lifted. a few people, do you think? Maybe, you know? Well, as they read it, there'll be a certain amount of clenching of teeth yeah. and um, uh, scratching of heads, probably. How did you get into that business in the first place? It's not something that maybe you take your O-levels and A-levels and, and fill out a form, is it? I mean, I was doing a law degree at Liverpool University. Yeah. Wasn't terribly keen on the law and went off in the summer holidays um, to sort of have a look at teaching. And the only things that were open in the summer holidays were home office approved schools, the old home office approved schools. And I was appalled by what I saw. And you know how it is when you're 22, 23, you sort of think, oh, I can do better than this. Um, so I was sort of heading for working with um, offenders. And- Institutions. Institutions, yeah. offenders, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And below me, I saw the advert for the prison service. They were looking for, assistant governors and a very wide range of people they were clearly looking for. So I thought, oh, I'll have a go for that. And to my surprise, there I was, they selected <laughs> me. And, you know, then I spent 33 years in the prison service. But you go up the ladder, do you? Or did you go straight in pretty high? Or? Uh, no, I went in as assistant governor. Oh, and I mean, it was very so you, much, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you run a small unit, but nonetheless, you're working closely with young offenders. Um, you, you've got a lot to learn. Mm. And, uh, uh, it's all very interesting. So in the book, I pick up what it was like as a young 24-year-old suddenly facing all 60 young offenders for which I was responsible and um, what they were like, uh, what the staff were like, what, what do we do to keep them busy, uh, were we having any effect on them? All those things sort of come out in those early chapters of the book. You see, that's interesting because you could have just gone in there and just gone, well, this is how it is and this is how it will stay. Yeah, yeah. But you didn't, you were a reformer. Oh, would you call oh, yourself that? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, no Sorry. doubt about yeah. it. I mean, you can't stay still. But, you know, quite honestly, 
a lot of people are reformers in all sorts of walks of life. They're looking at, is there a better way of doing things? And we've all got to do that mm. if, if the world's going to get better. Let's talk about Strange Ways, because mm. it is the headline thing. Yeah, yeah. How much of the book does that take up, by the way? Fair it takes up several chapters, yeah, because you've got to talk about... Well, let's, let's go back right to the beginning. My second posting was, in fact, to Strange Ways, but it was to the old women's prison there, which we turned into a Borstal Allocation Centre. They moved the women out to Style Prison. So I, there's a, an interesting account there of the beginnings of overcrowding, my first encounter with overcrowding, and how putting these youngsters three in a cell, how it destroyed the place in many ways. Then off I go and do lots of other things and come back to Strange Ways in 1986. And Strange Ways, frankly, was in a pickle, a real pickle. And it was in a pickle for a whole variety of reasons. It was hugely overcrowded. There'd be no investment in it. And uh, it had got stuck in a rut. Mm. So I mean, these are really old-fashioned prisons. Oh, aren't they? yeah. Swapping out. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, and yes, having yes. to a cell which should be designed it, for whatever. It was designed for something between around nine fifty. Yeah. Strange ways. We we locked up. We unlocked one dreadful morning, eighteen hundred. But most of the time I was there, it was between sixteen and seventeen hundred. So how many to a cell? Well, lo a lot well, of, a lot of them in. were three and two to a cell. You know? So I mean, it all kicked off. I mean when you were there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. They had a riot, but things did change out of that. It's almost like, do you have to go that far to, to, to see change come, or would you have been able to do something well, yourself? Well, what was so annoying was that in 1987, we had a major sort of revolution inside the prison service, changed staff's conditions of service, and were able to make huge progress um, in the regimes that we could offer because the staff free, were freed up from um, being so dependent on overtime and they became much more flexible in the way they worked. And for example, when I went there, we averaged about 40 prisoners a day in the workshops. Within two years, we got 400 a day in the workshops. I mean, it was incredible. The, the Keep them busy, give them exactly. something to do. Well, not only that, but it, rather than being locked up in their cells, if yeah. they're in the workshops, they can go use the loos, they can talk to their pals, yeah. um, they can earn a little bit of money. There are all those sort of bonuses um, that were coming. So Strange Ways was on the up, but the reality was we were still a very overcrowded um, Victorian prison and almost everybody was slopping out. Mm. Um, so it was, it was, ugh, it was really poor that way. And uh, the prisoners had a point in saying conditions were awful. They were right. Enough's I enough. was going around saying conditions were awful. What actually caused the riot is probably a bit of a matter of dispute. Um, and uh, the Wolf Report investigated it thoroughly. There are all sorts of. Um, factors that contributed to it. I mean, no, no doubt about that. But um, when that riot blew up, I was furious because w what they were doing was destroying progress. Mm. Um, but thank thankfully, out of the whole shenanigans of that year, um, the Wolf Report came. And the Wolf Report made all sorts of important improvements that when I moved on to Risley at the end of 1990, we were able to put into effect. So I then spent over five years at Risley, um, which was another place that had a dreadful history and very poor conditions for prisoners, and we were able to transform it. And that was was therapeutic for me. It was jolly therapeutic for the prisoners and yeah. the staff, um, but we achieved something there. Some people may say it's swung a little bit too far the other way. I mean, in the this is the Times, you know, jail boss is told to stop calling prisoners residents or clients. I mean, is that going too far? Paul, I can assure you, prisoners were prisoners. Yeah. And if the people who read my book will see that they're referred to, by and large, as prisoners, occasionally as offenders. Mm. But there's certainly no question of them being called residents or anything of that sort. What is important and what is, is missing from this latest little controversy about what we call prisoners is what's really important is the relationship between staff and prisoners and that prisoners and staff get to know each other because if people know each other, they manage much better. Relationships build, you get a more stable uh, set of conditions and the staff have a chance of pushing the whole program within the prison forward and the reason for that's perfectly simple. Um, 
we don't want people coming out of prison and reoffending in huge numbers, which is the current situation. We want as many as possible of those prisoners to come out and start contributing to society, not reoffend, pay their taxes, work, all those sorts of things. But the problem is, and you, this is the stuff that you'll no doubt be talking about in your chat, which we'll come to discuss at the moment, but you get the situation where they don't get rehabilitated, they learn a practice or two, and of course you've got this issue with the uh, prison wardens crossing the line and, and uh, because they don't get overpaid, do they? And you know, bringing stuff in, it's happening everywhere, it even happens here in the Isle of Man. Um, it, and it comes a hotbed, doesn't it? People start taking drugs, they, they learn how to pick locks. I mean, what can you do? Well, the reason for all this, quite frankly, is revealed in my book. Uh -huh. It is because, um, in the sense that the island, we just leave the island to one side for them because we on the whole tend to be a bit on the tailcoats of what goes on in England but and Wales. there has Wales. been a little bit of it, but okay. Uh, no, I'm talking about the general development of the prison. Okay. So, for example, Jerby is based upon standards that the UK has provided and developed over, over many years. And, and Jerby's a smashing little prison in lots of ways, um, the way it's built and the facilities they've got and so forth. But um, let's just go back. World War II, at the end of World War II, um, the prison population started to explode. During the 20s and 30s in England and Wales, there were about 10,000 people in prison. That was all. Now we've got 80,000 people in prison. Now that's a huge increase. And as that increase started in the 1940s, the management of the prison service, the leadership of the prison service, didn't do enough. And as a result, overcrowding just crept in. It was never properly authorised, it was never properly debated, and frankly the parliamentarians at the time were not much better, and the media wasn't much better, because it, it just sort of crept out and it, it became established. And by 1950s they were talking about 6,000 prisoners, three in a cell, um, and the thing just went from bad to worse, and it was never really grasped. Now, I think overcrowding then had a very bad effect on staff because the people at the top of the service, instead of focusing on staff, and staff are really crucial to making prisons work, didn't. And the staff got disillusioned. The staff got hacked off, frankly, with the whole thing. And in my book, I take through how the staff got hacked off, how industrial action started to come in, the awful results of that, some of the riots and the disturbances, the damage, all the rest of it. And this all can be traced back to a failure to properly train the staff, properly reward the staff, make sure they've got proper jobs. All that is, is I'm afraid, back to some very poor leadership, I think, going back into the 40s and 50s. Mm.